For me, my interest in photography started at, as a history student, not necessarily as an engagement with the images so much as I was engaging with visual cultures that emerge out of colonialism and the kind of colonial gaze that exists on the Indian subject. Obviously, a point of contact with this is Christopher Finney's work, um, things like the coming of photography in India and camera Indica. And then obviously he's so wonderful in looking at the camera as an extension of surveillance mechanisms. So looking at the camera in relation to the survey and the telegraph pole and you know post offices and other kinds of networks of, of empire. But then he kind of moves into the appropriation of the camera, if you will, mm -hmm. and the kinds of responses to visual technology that unfold in India as a response to just the introduction of this technology, I suppose, in the way that it's vernacularized. And that's something I kind of took into, I moved into a history of art. And I think that just that switch, I think, creates a different methodological shift. You're no longer looking at these images as kind of mute spectators or mute products of a larger historical move or a larger historical phenomenon. You're looking at the image as producing or resisting history, the image as, as a kind of bearer of an ideology or the bearer of a kind of scientific philosophy something you know it, it can the image can essentially do whatever it wants to it can resist it can be self-conscious in its own making and I think that shift moved me towards trying to understand practices uh, in the subcontinent that move away from the kinds of colonial apparatus that I was used to. Uh, for example, in my, my master's, I became very interested in Lionel Vent, just as this, almost biographically, actually, because he was this very elite, obviously, very Anglophile and Anglophone Sri Lankan man who studies in England and is exposed to all kinds of literature and his studies and then comes back and has an elite position in the law. But is also positioned in, in Colombo at the time in circles where he can meet Neruda and he's you know shipping books in from Florence and from London and, and those are informing his photographic practice. So mm -hmm. and I always kind of saw him as a as an interesting, almost tragic figure in that he doesn't get what he wants. And I think what he wants is to be at the center of a cultural world. So he's kind of drawing them to himself in Colombo when he inevitably moves back there. And then obviously he has this untimely death. But what I found interesting about his practice is how much it resisted ideas of what the subcontinent should look like in its photographic production. And I think that's what I started to look for after that. I think what drew me in subsequently was what are the unexpected histories of photography? How have we created binaries in our ideas of what photographs come from which places? Mm -hmm. And how can we move away from that? And I think that's really what spurred me into my PhD research, which is very different from that. You know, I moved back into working on, on India specifically. India, the nation state, very mm -hmm. self-consciously producing its own visual culture. Some of my work has been about how you cannot deny that the early Indian state is producing a kind of chauvinism in its own uh, state-sponsored film practices, for example, in the films division, or in films that are shown abroad at Cold War era cultural expositions. Mm -hmm. It's not so different from, say, America producing photographic exhibitions like The Family of Man. And so something I've been looking at more recently is the oppressive legacies of Cold War superpowers and the way that they produce themselves in lens-based practice and the way that countries like India that were non-aligned were both uh, affected by that and then producing responses to it this PhD research is thinking about non-alignment as a kind of methodology for thinking through photographic modernism in the first couple of decades of independent India. I'm very interested to know uh, more generally about your subcontinental thrust. As you mentioned, Lionel went. Um, were there other such elements, uh, stylistic elements or, you know, say conceptual elements that you talk about? that you found coming from other regions in the subcontinent that you would draw as a point to prefer? Someone I've been thinking of in, is um, the filmmaker Sukhdev Singh mm -hmm. Sandhu, a films division filmmaker who's commissioned by the Indian government, for example, to make a film called India 67, later renamed in Indian Day. Um, and the film is supposed to be shown at 
the Montreal, the World's Fair, the Expo 67. So he's commissioned to make a film for this 1967 World's Fair. There was a film festival in Montreal to coincide with the World's Fair. In a way, I see a kind of symmetry between him and Vent, because in the same way that Vent was brought on for the film A Song for Salon, you know, there's work to be done on some of these figures and the kinds of challenges that they all face. Sukhdev is given the job of representing India at a moment when the kind of Euro-American depiction of India was so staid, so much being used or mobilized as a foil against which to pose Euro-American modernity that mm -hmm. There's high hopes with that film, you know, he's trying, ultimately, I think something that he does is to say, India exists in multiple times. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's film sequences of nuclear reactors overlaid with um, soundscapes of a village school. And the idea is that there's always an uncomfortable fit. It doesn't really come together, I think, for him. And I think that's something right. that comes across in the film. Um, and ultimately, the film never made it to the film festival in time. And that's just an accident of transport at the time. And so the film is ultimately foiled in its own effort, I think, to reframe how India is shown internationally. You know, I'm sort of more interested now, I suppose, as we talk in the kind of internationalism that you're implicating um, through all that you're talking about, whether it's the family of man or other such ventures that materialize over here. But at the same time, you're also clarifying it within the context of the building of the nation state. How do you see these two grow in tandem? The sort of drive for uh, nationalism along with and alongside it, the need for internationalism in order to pitch the national as something that is outward looking. The work that I'm doing at the moment specifically hones in on non-alignment as this ideology, this commitment to internationalism and to internationalist de decolonization is the idea that it is deeply national. You know, Jawaharlal Nehru is talking about it in 1946 when he's in the provisional government and he's talking about how India will be framed in relationship to this commitment. So it's always been brought home, I think. The two are formed and therefore inextricably linked to one another. When we look at visual production at this time, you have to look at the flows and the networks and the contacts and the movements in and out. You have to look at the diplomatic world. Octavio Paz is winding up as the, the ambassador in New Delhi, which is something that I've done a little bit of work on. Or you have to look at Le Corbusier being asked to design this new capital for Punjab. And the responses to that also that are nuanced, you know, I think there's initial reactions of, of hesitation from the Nehru government when the Punjab government wants to bring in Le Corbusier. The Baroda school is up in arms against it. It's such a plural thing, the way that this internationalist endeavor is taken up. And the mm -hmm. flows or the manifestations of it are several. There's the ones that are about high state modernism. High state modernism means building this grand state capital for whom mm -hmm. you have to bring, for which you have to bring in Le Corbusier. But then there's other kinds of flows and exchanges happening. For example, something I've been really interested in is how the Baroda School, um, the Faculty of Fine Arts there, seems to have a moment where people are really looking at Mexican literature um, mm -hmm. through Paz. Um, and you know, you see that unfolding in Swaminathan's group 1890. But you also have uh, photographic pr practices from the Faculty of Fine Arts that show montages of Borges's face. Methodologically, it's interesting, or it opens up all kinds of opportunities for how we think about modernism the oppression of the word modernism, let's say, or the use of the term modernism is also really fraught in this way, because I think there's points where it's really taken up self-consciously. Um, and there are points where devices of it, the montage, the collage are taken up, although rejecting the Euro-American hegemony of the term modernism itself, or the expectations of modernism, which tend to be, as James Scott looks at it, highly uh, supervised, highly top-down, form of national improvement. It has to be seen as to being a form of looking outside, but also drawing in. I mean, I've spoken at, at length with Jyoti Bhatt about some of this and just the kind of flow of pho photographic magazines or a photographic equipment, I think is testament to this movement. And we can't look at this period without that movement or 
travel and contact. So, you know, Nasreen Mohammadi's family having a shop in Bahrain of photography and therefore her ability to bring devices or literature in and out. I guess uh, one of the things that I'm sort of taking from here, and maybe we can go into the publication, is this question of uh, canonization. Um, while you were approaching the publication, and just, you know, let's say if one does a reading of the table of contents, seems to in a way suggest that you had to deal with a lot of this question of the canon in order to maybe arrive at something more than that. Can you talk a little bit about that? just starting with the table of content. Yeah, I mean, I think that the big challenge of producing a work like this is on the one hand, you want to be able to produce, make a case for the fact that there were multiple practices that address similar questions. You know, just the chapter on power and posterity, the idea that portraiture emerges in the studios as a form of social mobility, but also social stature and that multiple studios or multiple kinds of practices across the subcontinent point towards this. Also, ultimately, many of these chapters were questions we were asking of ourselves. Can we see something here? Is there something that we can join together here? And so the challenge, I think, with a book like this was to say, we're presenting theories that we would be happy to see questioned. But this is kind of what we've come to at this moment. And also, this is not comprehensive. So there are many practices that, that don't fit, you know. There is no final word on this. Just in the course of the year and a half since the book has come up, we have, I think, individually come up with um, alternative ways that you could see it. It doesn't have to be mm -hmm. temporally divided. It doesn't have to be that we only speak of um, mm -hmm. photojournalism in the early Republic. We don't only have to think about an engagement with colonialism in post-colony. As mm -hmm. possibilities, something I was thinking about was the fact that you can take up particular series by photographers like you know, if you looked at the Anita Singh's Fire Room series, speaks to the photos division. Or you could look at the, the painted photographs of Emma Dali Khan and relate them to, say, Gori Gill and Radesh Vangad series of painted photographs. Or look at Seva Santa Yoganantan's photographs that are also painted. And you can draw various thematic possibilities from this huge corpus. And the challenge we had was that for the longest time, such a volume has not existed. The book is an opening question. Responses, I think, will continue to produce themselves over the next few years. So if, if one is going to look at uh, new histories of photography within the subcontinent, does the publication for you make an argument that it can be done through questions of practice? you know, artist motivations, for instance, which are, which are interesting always to discover. I mean, your reference to Nasreen and uh, her family is interesting. Does it address, for instance, psychosocial elements in, in photography for you? Does it look at questions of transnationality? How does it subvert the local? Um, because it's so located in a, in a place, um, what are the strategies that you might have used in order to uh, subvert those stereotypings of how one might consider photography in India to be? I think the big question that is kind of made evident in the writing of the book, where I think something that we were very keen on was keeping a tone of uncertainty. Or if, if, you, if you read through the book, the language is always one of things as a possibility. We are, I think, in writing about photography in India, often in a double bind. Do you take up, for example, genres or divisions that hold up in other places and then apply them to here? And are you slathering this place with the expectations of another? I think the other is, do you deny the fact that India had a moment of decolonialism? So can we deny the kind of centrality of particular political modes, obviously framed in relation to a kind of imperial center? And so how do you move out of a particular framework mm -hmm. when that framework or that political legacy is constantly reinscribed in practices well into the 90s, 2000s? When I look at Kate Kisait's work on the Siddhis, mm. I am instinctively drawn, I think, to thinking about other moments of engagement with 
let's say, communities at the margins that has existed through both colonial India and post-colonial India. But I think that, therefore, I'm very interested now. But coming up with small thematic possibilities that are spoken to in, say, three or four practices or three or four series by photographers. In organizing an anthology, you're always looking for a kind of consistency that we can move away from. And I think that's how we can create counter structures. However, maybe in order to create a counter structure, you have to first present the structure. I was interested in more uh, your view on, on the contemporary section, that, which was like a small part of the book. Coming from this uh, conversation about colonial photography and then its effects on, on post-colonial and then post, post-modern readings of photography in India, how did you go about thinking through some of the contemporary practices and structuring those conversations? And- the, the last chapter was really a challenge because it's ongoing. Mm-hmm. We can only present something that, and see whether or not that question is indeed applicable. But something that we had both noticed was a kind of return to the book as a vehicle for photography, the form of layout that they choose, the kind of move towards si- simultaneity or of seriality. You know, someone who I've been thinking of recently is Polumi Basu's new work. Centralia and that book and again it's this you know it's a collation of testimonies and stories and photo you know her own photographs the other move of course was in we were thinking about the biennial and this diffusion I think of photographic practice and there are visual artists who use photography who wouldn't necessarily identify as photographers and so you have the kind of bridging of these two fields together where photography was always had this kind of outsider status something we've been asking a lot of people in these conversations is their perspective on pedagogy and practice right and the book being such a sort of pedagogical endeavor almost. Do practices uh, sort of steer pedagogy or, or does the opposite also happen and how does it happen? I don't think that pedagogy should stir practice. I don't, I think pedagogy should potentially exist only to make sense of practices, putting them together in new possibilities. I am nervous about pedagogy framing practice excessively. I think though that this is one of the challenges of, for example, art school pedagogy, the way that artists are being driven to read the same texts that are central to art historical pedagogy. And so you have a real anxiety, I think, in practices that can be a side effect of that reading of oneself and one's uh, creative practice in relation to text, you know. I mean, again, the question of, of how these two things should be divided is curious. I work on a moment that has now passed. The extent to which I engage with contemporary practice is that, for example, I'm looking at this return in photographic and artistic and filmic practice to uh, reassessing mid-century internationalism. For example, Naeem's films on mid-century flows as one obviously on on the non-aligned movement to meetings in a funeral. Uh, But then something I've been thinking about in relation to that is Seher Shah's kind of re-adaptations of Chandigarh architectural photos. Or Dayanita Singh's more recent work that looks at architectural montages that are ultimately spaces that you cannot be in. These spaces are uninhabitable. And so what I'm always aware of in my own work is almost sitting as a kind of field observer. Mm -hmm. I think maybe that's quite important in the way that we write on art practice. Be aware of your positionality. Be aware of the fact that, you know, Mm -hmm. obviously there's a potential for something that I write to frame someone else's work. You know, you obviously have moments that Things have been starkly the opposite. But no, for right now, I'm kind of happy being the non-interfering anthropologist, if that makes sense. Uh, uh, Over the last, certainly a decade, there has been such a move towards uh, the unearthing of private archives, personal collection. Now, I guess the question for us is, is there an effort or will there be an effort to find new content, to create counterflows, so that the, the content that has already been in circulation 19th century or 21st century, you know, can find a so-called parallel 
one of the, the questions uh, that comes to mind vis-a-vis -vis your arguments is that how do you do that when you know there's there's need or dire need in this day and age to find new content which certainly exists out there in order to uh, not even subvert as i was saying you know i would rather use what azuli was suggesting not to find a counter history but a counter to history something that i have been thinking about in the course of the phd was realizing how much those who interrogate mid century modernism in india are archaeologists <laughs> archival material that will never be found but there are whispers of it in other people's writing or whispers of it in anecdote um and so something that i was very struck by in the course of my own research was how much i am dependent on oral histories i am dependent on happenstance i am dependent on in a funny way a kind of magic of mm. coincidence with stuff that's piecing it together at the moment is being at the right place at the right time meeting that one person or having that one person uh, get back in touch or meeting that one librarian you know and that in the absence of or in all of these erasures that exist in state archives perhaps we have been valorizing particular collections far more than others uh something i've been reassured by also is the way that spaces like instagram are being used to upturn hierarchies of display it's been amazing to see the ingenuity of people mm -hmm. in an absence of resources or in an absence of of organizational patronage producing other histories mm -hmm. but essentially i guess something i was just going to say as a as a last thing is that essentially we need to reintroduce the hand you know so something that i was so pleased by in this kind of turn to the photo book or the fact that people that photographers have been self publishing you know some of these really tremendous moves towards self publishing something that has come out of that is the return to the absolute the tactility of the photograph you know the fact that it's not always this distant thing on a gallery wall it is to be held it is to be folded it is to be kept in a file it is to be removed from the file and put in a frame it's it manifests in multiple ways and i think something that we can maybe do curatorially is to revive that mm -hmm. to remind viewers or visitors that the hand that chooses is kind of one of the hands involved in this